Hey team, uh, so welcome to my talk, uh, Computation Alchemy. Um, so uh, before we get into precisely why I have summoned you all here today, and I did summon you, I typed some words into a text box and now here you all magically are. Um, so a uh, bit of a disclaimer, this presentation does not constitute an endorsement of any religion, software, community, philosophy, plane of existence, deity, or assertion of factual accuracy of the contents of the aforementioned presentation. So I just want to point out here that nobody wins credulity points or like nobody's going to respect you um, if uh, you go back home and you say, this thing is uh, God's honest truth because a wizard in a field told me. Um, you don't seem to see that thing in the citations on Wikipedia. So apparently that's not a cultural norm. Um, so uh, I also want to point out here that I uh, a, am not saying any of the following will fix any problems, real or perceived. Um, I'm also not a professional anthropologist or historian, so obviously do your own research. Um, uh, I also do not have or believe in supernatural, divine or psychic powers. That said, other beliefs are available. So um, who's, <laughs> who's this arsehole? Um, I'm Graham Ware, or uh, Matt, if you're uh, into that sort of thing. Um, I'm a security professional. Um, so yeah, I work in cybersecurity, um, and I am definitely 100% a real wizard. Uh, I specialize in retro computer necromancy and cyber occultism, and uh, neither of those terms are totally made up. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm very interested in the esoteric. I like being surprised. I especially like being confused. So I spend a lot of my spare time perpetually confusing myself. Um, and I'm, uh, I suppose you could say I have a rationalist interest in the irrational, um, which is kind of to say that like, when it comes to occultism and mysticism, uh, I'm particularly interested in like, the psychological, sociological, anthropological, artistic, and aesthetic aspects. Um, I just think it's like, a real wild ride, to be honest. Um, and so what's this talk about? Well, basically, I do magic on a computer, uh, or more accurately, I reproduce and then extrapolate on magical, mystical, and occult systems. Um, and so this, this concept of computational alchemy, I suppose, uh, if I wanted to boil it down to something simple, which it isn't, because it's tremendously confusing, um, it's basically taking the credulously fanci fanciful and mashing it together with the technically rigorous. Um, just as a word of warning here as well, I'm going to go quite fast here um, because I'm trying to cram in two esoteric topics and convincing you all that I'm not totally divorced from reality all within 30 minutes. Um, so we'll see how we get on. Um, oh, look, my time has stopped. That's really helpful. Okay. Um, so uh, basically, like I say, reproduce and extrapolate on magical, uh, mystical, and occult systems. Um, and I do most of this on Plan 9 from Bell Labs operating system. This is a research operating system from the 1980s and 1990s uh, that was intended to be the successor to research Unix, which nobody ever used. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, grimoires, so spellbooks, uh, rationality, Plan 9, and uh, a couple of projects which I've worked on uh, tarot FS, which is a tarot card file system, and uh, QSP, uh, Kabbalah Space Program, which is just, I don't really know where I was going with that one, to be honest, and I still don't quite know where I'm going with it, but it's great fun. Um, and then maybe some future work at this time at the end. So uh, here is a screenshot of uh, a Plan 9 desktop. This is not my screenshot. I realized um, that I didn't have a screenshot of a normal Plan 9 desktop. Uh, but this is where we're basically kind of going from. And this is where we're going to. This is my desktop. Um, this is a kind of fairly heavily patched version of uh, Ninefront, which is a Plan 9 distribution. Um, and it's got a number of non-upstreamed patches, which you can sort of get from the community, um, especially the theming stuff. Thanks, Sigrid. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of my own uh, hacks in there as well. Um, code is available at the end. Um, and I suppose the biggest question of this whole thing, why would you even do this? Why would you turn up in a field full of STEM types and then try and convince them to do magic? This is the slide which I have edited and re-edited most because um, I honestly still not quite convinced myself as to why I'm doing this. Um, but basically, I'm, you know, I'm kind of curious about the evolution of belief systems and what they tell us about society and thought in general. Um, and spell books and grimoires, are just pretty gnarly and they're full on weird as well. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, 
But I guess the other kind of big thing here, and I think one of the themes I want you to take away from this is um, uh, like, I learn by doing, right? And that's participating. Um, and about this idea of like not necessarily doing something to create something productive, because this is not productive in any way, shape or form, um, but actually doing something because you care about it, because you want to be involved in it. Um, and basically like computers are kind of how I do everything else. Um, so they're kind of the lens through which I suppose I interact with the world. Um, it kind of seemed to make sense at the time. You've got to have a hobby, right? Um, but I guess if you're still confused by the end, um, which I certainly will be, um, I guess an easy way of thinking about it is like playing air guitar or a really involved computer game. Like it's just kind of participating in that thing that you love. So uh, important concept in alchemy, solve a coagula. So this is Latin for dissolve and coagulate. So this is how we're gonna break down this talk um, into two parts. Uh, first part is solve, uh, to dissolve, so to take apart. And then the second part will be to coagulate, so to put back together again. So we'll be taking those concepts, mashing them together in, uh, in some weird way and seeing what falls out. So let's dive straight in. So um, I guess the place where I start is, uh, obviously with spell books and grimoires. And, um, and I suppose like uh, if I were to make an analogy here, trying to understand the thought processes of the people who have come before me in different cultures by, by um, you know, reading their spell books is kind of almost like the approach of trying to understand uh, early 2000s, the, the, the psyche of the early 2000s web developer by buying a Macromedia Flash cookbook. Um, but basically, you know, I kind of love these because they're like incredibly gnarly. They're often like uh, pseudopigraphica. So basically books written by one person and then they've basically attributed it to someone else, someone more famous or someone who doesn't actually exist. Um, and, and, you know, th this is the sort of stuff that we need these days would consider like misinformation, right? This is stuff where we go, that doesn't work. That doesn't do what it says it should do. Um, and so you've got to ask yourself like, the authors, are they credulous? Are they charlatans trying to sell snake oil? Are they speaking in some encoded way? You know, which, why? You know, somebody wrote this for a reason. Um, and I think one of my favorite things about uh, these spell books is they are oddly specific in the way they tell you to do things. Um, especially when you come across two translations as I did when I was, uh, when I was doing some of the research for this, in which uh, one, one recipe says some sparrows brains, and then you read another one that says three sparrows brains, and you're like, oh, this guy actually tried it. <laughs> two sparrows brains, not enough. Four, a bit too mushy. Um, but anyway, uh, so, just to kind of dive into some examples here. So uh, the Black Pullet was one of the first grimoires that I got my hands on, which claims the earth is filled almost to the center with gnomes. Um, to, to expound on this, uh, Le Petit Albert says that when you are treasure hunting and you're digging for gold, you can appease the gnomes by wearing a laurel on your head um, and, um, and then making different incenses for the different days of the week, depending on when you're planning on digging for gold. Um, it was only in taking a closer look at this that I realized that there wasn't in fact a, uh, a perfume in there for Thursday. So uh, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, don't go treasure hunting on a Thursday, the gnomes will get you. Another favorite is uh, the Le Megaton, uh, the lesser key, I'm probably saying that wrong, I've only ever read it. Um, it's the lesser key of Solomon, and it's got the rituals for Solomonic conjuring, um, where basically you stand in the big circle and you summon the demon in the triangle. Um, and these are basically the Goetia, so they're demonic spirits. Um, and this is all actually kind of descended from Christianity somewhere along the line. This is all kept alive by monks and priests. Um, but basically, like uh, all of the demons in there, are based on the pseudo monarchia demo. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try. What's the point? You can read. Um, but yeah, many different manuscripts, manuscripts of different provenance that all claim to come from uh, King Solomon. Um, especially really interesting here that, like, if you get good translations of these books, the footnotes are amazing. Um, and it's quite common to find different extrapolations and mistranslations, because, of course, most of this was done in the age of manuscripts and not the printed press. So you, you get miscopies and things. Um, 
uh, like, for example, this especially sassy uh, footnote about Crowley, which turns up quite a lot because Alistair Crowley was not particularly rigorous in his work, um, about a mistranslation of uh, something being about a hat. Uh, and Crowley expounds on this by adding or headdress. Um, and it was actually something to do with, like, not being in fear when the demon turns up. Anyway, <laughs> I could talk about this stuff all day long. Um, so, uh, and then another example here, we've got the, uh, the, the Hand of Glory. So uh, you might have heard of this one before. I think this has been in pop culture and fairly in a few different places. But a uh, Hand of Glory is basically the, uh, the left hand of a hanged thief uh, that is cured in a jar full of spices, is dug up on the uh, dog days and dried out. And then uh, you basically place in the hand a candle made from the tallow rendered from the fat of the hanged thief. And then if you light it and you hold it when you go into a house, everyone will be paralyzed. Basically for robbing houses, this one, which is not very nice. But uh, I mean, the, the one at the bottom there is actually the, um, is a claimed example in a uh, museum in Whitby. The one uh, in the top right is from Le Petit Alba and the one on the top left is uh, my one. Um, you can see that the fingers went all wonky because it was a really hot day. And now it just looks even more creepy. <laughs> Um, and I suppose you look at all this stuff and you go like, well, we wouldn't believe that stuff, right? The dominant paradigm in the world today is unbounded economic growth in a closed system. In what way does that make any sense at all? We're basically talking about the belief that we can continue to mine all the resources and it will just be fine. Um, and so you kind of start to realize that actually we don't necessarily live in the most logical system. We consider this to be the age of rationality, but we kind of rest on our laurels in that one. And we don't really seek for what are the irrationalities that, that underlie everything we do. Um, and to kind of go a little bit further on this, so I read this really fantastic book, uh, Magic, Science, Religion, and the Scope of Rationality. Um, and um, I, I think it, it's, it's a really interesting anth anthropological book. Um, and uh, one of the things that it really points out is like that actually the divergence of magic and religion and science, like, I mean, it was obviously a process, but really starts to happen around the 16th century. So this idea that like magic, religion, science are completely separate entities and always have been. And like, you know, the three like to claim as much. Absolutely not the case. They were all sort of a common philosophy. Um, and I think it's kind of important to take an anthropological approach to this. Like, and, and I think the real inspiration here was um, this guy, uh, Wittgenstein. Um, there's a critique in there. He's criticizing this guy called Fraser, who's basically saying that like, you know, all magical practice is based on some mistake or misbelief or misunderstanding. And uh, Wittgenstein gets incredibly sassy about this, which is fantastic reading. Um, but he basically says that, uh, there's a misunderstanding there that we're taking our cultural understanding of like causation, you do a thing to achieve a thing and, mi and like misusing that when applying that to other cultures. So the example he gives is one of the, uh, the rain dance. Um, the idea here being that like, you know, you get your cultures who'll do their rain dance. Notably, they only do it just before the rainy season because they're not stupid. They don't think that dancing is gonna make it rain. It's an act of participation, but like, you know, from a personal viewpoint, one of the things which, uh, which I do on a semi-regular basis is I do tarot spreads or rune castings. I don't think that those are going to change the future in any way, shape or form, other than my interpretation of them. And I think it's really important sometimes to actually have that time to stop, to look at a system and to go, okay, what things here do I have agency over? What things do I need to change? What things can I do? And I think by really sort of approaching that idea of participation in the world around you, even the things that you can't control, gives you a really strong sense of what can I do here and what can I not? And it's actually a pretty good way of getting out of the anxiety of feeling like you need to be in control all the time. I mean, other approaches are available. Um, so like digging in a little bit more into the, some of these, uh, some of these spell books, and I'm gonna look at two in, in particular, like I've mentioned this one uh, already, but like, uh, Le Petit Alba, this just, it's such a wild ride. I mean, so there's instruction on resistance to torture, making dogs not bark. That's another thing about robbing houses. Um, faking a, a, the head of St. John the Baptist so that you can give uh, false uh, prophecies to people. Um, 
fabricating a philosopher's stone, the, uh, the magnum opus of uh, alchemy, um, but also like stuff on how to fabricate, but also counterfeit things like ambergris, gold, and other expensive alchemical components. Um, so you can see that actually this book is very much about skullduggery. You know, it's being like a bit of a, a bit of a chancer. Um, and, and it just kind of goes to show like some of the, the, the different motivations here. Um, especially of interest is that this, this actually apparently did very well amongst French farmers in the 18th century, despite the fact that all the recipes are wildly expensive to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, so sort of contrast that. So uh, I've said on the previous slide, so appeals to prior art of Agrippa. So um, Agrippa wrote three books of occult philosophy. And uh, as spell books go, this one's a heck in chonka, quite frankly. Like I wanted to bring it with me, but it's like this. Um, and uh, so the three books there are on natural magic, celestial magic, and divine magic. And, and the idea is basically like, th this is a very credulous approach. This, this, this guy is trying to gather together all of the different knowledge of magical systems that he can kind of come up with. And it's, it, you know, he means it. Um, I mean, interestingly enough, it was published in 1533 when Agrippa was much older, um, as he didn't really stand by the work anymore that he'd done when he was younger. So he, he was like, yeah, I kind of don't really like this, but there's a leaked manuscript going around that's not correct. So I wanted to set the record straight in the most 2020 move of like 1533. Um, but one of the interesting things in here is that like he's constantly citing uh, Pliny, um, Pliny being from like 79 AD, right? And, and citing things like ostriches can digest iron, magnets lose their magnetism if you put diamonds next to them, wasps are generated by horse corpses. And, and you start to go like, I think one of the things you can learn from this is like, you, you know, when you, when you, somebody says something and you're like, mm, I'm not sure about that, but I'm pretty sure somebody must have fact checked it. 1500 years. And I'm pretty sure that Pliny was getting that from someone else as well. Um, and so, you know, that, that there is that sort of question in the credulity of all of this and like the effectiveness, but on the flip side, there's an experiment in 1941 doing neutron bombardment of mercury to turn it into an isotope of gold. This is transmutation of a, of a metal into gold, like the magnum opus of alchemy. The problem is that the gold is in fact cursed or in modern parlance, radioactive. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, it produces a, uh, so it produces, I think, two different isotopes of gold, um, gold 198 and gold uh, 199, I think 197 is the stable isotope. Um, so they've both got a half-life of around three days and are actually used in, uh, use their cursed powers in radiotherapy, uh, which is a bit of a uh, roller coaster of good and bad news right there. Um, and actually, I didn't throw this slide in until this morning because uh, I had a bit of a panic where I had to do some extra research on the isotopes of gold because I looked at the schedule for this afternoon. And in workshop five this afternoon, you can go and do that experiment. So <laughs> I just had to double check because I'd said it was radioactive. And I was like, wait, they're going to be making radioactive? Yes, you are going to be making radioactive gold. Um, and we've all seen this quote before as well. You know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic from Arthur C. Clarke. And like, you know, we kind of design computer systems after this. So you've got your demons, your processes that look after your computer for you. Remote login is a lot like astral projection. I use a lot of the bind command later on. Um, and, you know, you might have seen this before as well. You know, if you ever feel uh, like a code is just a hack, but it works, a CPU is a rock that we tricked into thinking. Which leads me to kind of go like, and haha, ha, only serious here, any sufficiently effective magic will be recategorized as technology. This is an exercise in tautology, right? In the modern age, if you, something is magic, it means that it didn't work. If it did work, you call it science and technology. And I think this kind of brings us on to a point about syncretism and syn synthesis. So like in the modern occult tradition, like um, there's lots of like, 
uh, of, of the idea of taking from different cultures, different religions, different schools of belief, and trying to create something new and trying to create equivalences across. Um, and there's lots of commonalities in, in mythology. So like Sumerian creation epic, for instance, has a flood that Noah's flood sounds awfully familiar to. Um, but yeah, I, I guess kind of one of the things I think about in all of this is like, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of like why these beliefs aren't, aren't useful to us anymore, sometimes I kind of wonder, it's because we wrote them down. You write a thing down, it no longer becomes an oral tradition. You stop changing the information to suit the modern age. And so from that point of view, knowing I'm running massively behind at this point, um, we're going to look into two different systems. We're going to look at tarot, and we're going to look at hermetic Kabbalah, uh, and we are going to throw them together on a computer. Um, and we're going to use Plan 9 from Bell Labs. So uh, one of the things I love about Plan 9, uh, and 9 front is the modern fork, which I'm using, um, almost completely useless for anything outside, modern com uh, outside of computing. Uh, so com uncorrupted by the mores of capitalism. Uh, Unicode native for magical symbols, namespaces for blasting open the doors of perception so different processes see a different view of the world. And it's built for distributed grid computing, which I'm not gonna get into, that's a whole talk in of itself. Um, but everything is a file. Um, and that's kind of pretty, uh, I apologize for some of these slides. They are not very readable. I'll put up a transcript like when I share the slides later. Um, but so here's an example, the web file system. Um, basically, this is like using a web browser, but it's a file system. So you go into uh, Mount Web, you clone a session by reading the clone file, then you echo out to the CTL file, which URL you want to talk to, you read the body file and it'll have the contents there and it'll stay there on disk. So, I mean, this is analogous to opening a tab, typing something in, going there and you've got it there in your tab. And so like a normal person, I looked at this and went, that would be good for a tarot file system. Um, so effectively, you know, you draw the cards in a specific order and analyze them. Um, you, and, and the idea was being able to specify options about the spreads with a control file, it'll stay on disk. Um, and so like tarot specifically, uh, this is pretty easy to implement. Like it's 78 cards, uh, so 22 in the, uh, the major arcana. That's like the extra um, suit in tarot. And they're the cards that you'd be familiar with, like the Fool, Magician, Death. Um, and then you've got the, uh, the four other suits, so cups, swords, wands, and pentacles, relating to water, air, fire, and earth. Um, and basically there's a common flow to the stories in, in there, but like, it's just nice as a sort of like allegorical scheme. Um, think of it almost as like a storytelling device with a built-in random number generator for uh, prompting self-analysis. So anyway, I, I got on and did this and I implemented it and I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but basically you clone a new spread by reading the clone file. Um, you specify the spread, um, the sort of spread style by writing to the CTL file. So you might be able to see in this example, I've echoed uh, spread past, present, future advice to CTL, and then drawn four cards um, by just reading the draw file. And you've got death, uh, upright, seven of cups, reversed, so on and so forth. And then you can see them on disc, um, sort of with their, with their sort of named card layouts. And um, basically like, uh, I've got a whole slew of features for this. So user supplied card definition, so you can actually have the description and definition of the card uh, displayed when you, when you read the cards out. Um, different decks, so like, uh, this is all ba based on, so this is the, uh, the famous uh, Ryder Smith weight uh, tarot set, which most people are familiar with, but there are actually loads of different ones and, and older ones as well. Um, and uh, basically like you, you, can, you can do different things. I've also made so you can do Nordic rune casting on it as well. Um, so I guess uh, here's, uh, here's what everybody wants to see is the graphical version. Well, I basically hacked this one together by uh, taking uh, Plan 9's windowing system, Rio, actually nests recursively. So you can run the windowing system within the windowing system ad nauseum. So basically I, uh, with a 15 line script, uh, launched a new windowing system that uh, set a, and someone's Etsy tarot cloth as the wallpaper, and then just rendered all the images from the file system. So you literally just point the script to your, uh, your spread and it'll render. Um, and then I did this thing with uh, Tatva meditation, 
I'm not going to go into what that is, but it basically relates to um, the uh, the four classical uh, elements and then a fifth, um, which is spirit or quintessence. Um, and basically, these map onto tarot. So I did another script where uh, basically uh, the original program which I wrote was mostly a test, and and it changed which uh, which one it was rendering by key presses. So uh, what I did was uh, create the script that would basically rebind the process's keyboard file system into Tarot's namespace, then continually read and just send the correct key press based on the suit that was drawn of the last card. Um, I'm not quite sure why I did that, but hey, it seemed fun. Um, and uh, the most recent experiment I did was actually taking uh, Plan 9's grid chat, which is basically where people say IRC is multiplayer notepad, um, grid chat is multiplayer cat. You're mounting a single file over the network and all writing and reading from it. It's wild. Um, and it's full of very weird people saying weird things. So I mounted that over dev random, which is the source of randomness um, on the file system, and was able to demonstrate that I can, in fact, uh, divine from the ether by pulling the information out of the internet and use that as a divining system. Um, the other project which, uh, which I wanted to touch on, I'll have to talk about very quickly, um, is uh, Kabbalah Space Program. So uh, this is originally based on Jewish mysticism, so Kabbalah, which is a really beautiful cosmology. It's a theory of how God actually spoke the world into existence using the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the 10 Sephiroth representing the numbers one to 10. Very deep, very complex. Go away and read about it. It's fantastic. Now, uh, there's an iteration on this Hermetic Kabbalah, which is kind of iterating and adding more equivalences and things like that. Um, and the, the thing with like Hermetic Kabbalah is the people who are into it get really in on the glyph. Like the, the actual image there is not the important thing. The concepts behind it are. But I kind of thought, well, let's riff on that idea. So uh, I looked at this and like a normal person saw a uh, computational many body problem. Um, so effectively decided what if we treated all of the paths between as uh, springs and used Hooke's law. Um, and um, this can only be solved computationally, by the way, um, which uh, basically I wanted to see what would happen if I changed coefficients. Like, can we get it to exhibit chaotic behavior? What shape will it make? Will it tell us something about the universe? So like a normal person, I got down to... Uh, working on it, being able to draw it out. And um, so basically it consists of two programs, QSP Draw for drawing, QSP Sim for doing simulations. I also uh, utilized um, Plan 9's um, plumbing system here. So I could just select text, middle click plumb, and, uh, and it would know to basically draw it. Uh, all of the data is stored in the back end as uh, Plan 9's network database, because it was a database that was sitting around that nobody was using. So I thought that'll do. Um, and then was also able to use the same rebinding trick to actually uh, create animations. So this is just every second is just quitting the program and rendering the next thing. And you can see this crazy like patterns happen that because I drew this out in a wonky way, uh, the central node actually averts completely, um, which uh, is of deep philosophical significance, I'm sure, if, you, if I had the time to explain it. Um, but uh, basically, I saw the outcome of this first experiment, and um, all I could see was this. <laughs> the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was basically the very rushed story of uh, how we got here. Um, I have some ideas for future work, uh, up and to and including achieving the ninth level of gridding with transfinite power set grids. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. It's early days yet. Uh, I might get sucked into the portal first. Um, but yeah, basically, if you, want to, um, if you want to see any of the code, it's there. Um, follow me on Twitter or on Mastodon, uh, and I'll, I'll post uh, some tr uh, the slides and hopefully some, some transcripts of the bad slides. And uh, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'm going to be in the bar. So thank you very much.